Issue 447 of uh, African Energy had its uh, usual very full agenda. Um, we went from um, a range of issues such as um, um, in uh, Sudan, Somalia, where um, clan divisions and instability threat to uh, strand assets, all the way through to uh, various developments in the East African power industry. Um, commercial and industrial developments, which we're seeing an awful lot. Um, some interesting upstream issues, including the uh, Angola Onshore Awards. Um, in the downstream, uh, we had Egypt again. The whole question of the Lebanon gas pipeline was up. And we ended with um, a view uh, on the energy transition and how the what were once called the oil majors, now energy companies, were doing it, spurred by Total Energy um, and its new outlook and strategy paper, but with um, much more besides. But we started on the front page with uh, Sudan and indeed the question of exports from Su South Sudan. Um, in uh, the story based on protesters blocking the shipments of crude through Port Sudan, and that was written by our um, hydrocarbons editor James Gavin, but working with uh, Nadik Shumam in Khartoum, which is a very good development. And actually, I was going to ask you, James, you know, we, we, we have a lot of correspondents in Africa. There are countries we haven't had so many. And it's the first article that Nadik had written um, for and with us. But he's actually someone uh, amongst several um, Sudanese journalists you've met doing training in Khartoum and then during the pandemic via Zoom. H how does that work exactly? Indeed, yeah. Well, um, this, this was a, a project that was backed um, by the, the British government and the British Council. Uh, uh, and just before COVID hit the world in March 2020, I was out in Khartoum um, doing uh, in-person training with, with Sudanese um, business journalists uh, um, and uh, and it was really really interesting to get their sense you know th this is in a particular um, uh, interesting time for Sudan it, it, it was still on the um, terrorism list of Washington uh, terrible um, uh, deprivations all, all through the country uh, um, and a reform program in the offing that would uh, obviously have some some near-term negative effects on 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 reliving standards so so there was a big story to tell and the uh, the thinking was that there was perhaps an opportunity to to really help um upgrade local journalism standards so that they're sort of telling this story to to a sudanese public explaining issues like um imf um, um programs and, and, and some debt relief and, and just getting it over to to the to the ordinary Citizen, so that that's what it was all about. Um, once once COVID hit, I was mostly doing it via WhatsApp. In in fact, Zoom and WhatsApp, mostly WhatsApp, because I had that, that, the the huge advantage of, of most people in their when they're in lockdown in their homes in Khartoum, they could uh, access that mechanism. So you know, I would, uh, we, training was delivered that way. Um, it's really strong, uh, you know. The, the, I'm not saying the standards of Sudanese journalism is the highest in the world, but there was some real enthusiasm there, and they really wanted to get a grip to tell their story. And, and I think this this particular, when you had the um, eastern protests blocking off this, this the the oil pipelines, I thought it made a, it was a great opportunity to get get a local flavour, to get some of the local reporting in on this. Um, and so Nazik, um, one of the brightest of the bunch, so she's. Uh, uh, quite an experienced um, business journalist over there in Khartoum. She 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 um, got her on the job. And did 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 some good work. Well, we, um, we welcome yeah. her indeed. It's very useful. I, I know actually the journalistic training and working with people is a is a very good thing. Uh, a few months ago, my my friend and friend of African Energy, um, Elie Dior and Dour, um, who's a veteran. Uh, I think Alie wouldn't mind us saying, francophone journalist, but Alie and I did a, a training program sponsored by uh, Echobank for um, francophone uh, business journalists. And, and it was extremely interesting and, and, and rewarding on, on both sides. You know, we learned, they learned, 
and we can um, widen our network. Just to just to, to finish this small segment, you and Nazik have written about the Sudanese, the Eastern Sudan problem, and the consequences it can have for Sudan. Um, there is a continu continued flow of really problematic issues around mm. Khartoum and the the political issue, and indeed in South Sudan. Um, International Crisis Group last week produced, I thought, a really good piece of research on South Sudanese oil. How, how do you actually feel about uh, the, the, the two, those two countries? Absolutely. Um, well, in, in a way, Sudan, Khartoum Sudan, in, um, in, 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 in the sense, um, has had quite a, a good summer uh, after a, a really tough, tough few years um, in, in, in the aftermath of the, uh, the overthrow of, of, of Bashir and this, this the creation of the civilian military uh, transitional council, um, you had, uh, I think it's the fastest ever um, accreditation, accreditation to the HIPIC program. So you know, they, they got onto it faster than anyone else has in this um, way. So, so debt relief um, is, is now a real thing for Sudan, which will really help the, the, overall, the overall state of things. They got it, the, this seemed to be um, the uh, outcome of the new finance minister, Ibrahim Jibril, who seemed to have had quite a, an impact since taking over a few months ago. So um, all things considered, and they're coming from a, a very bad place, but, but things, things are, were looking up. The protests in the East, though, are, are, are a sign that there's hugely complex, intractable issues, political issues, to do with the, uh, the, the regions. I mean, they, so in Juba, in, in South, there was a big peace deal in November 2020, which, which involved most of the main provinces in uh, uh, regions in, in Sudan basically uh, giving them a, a larger slice, slice of the pie, um, and particularly sort of Blue Nile State, uh, Darfur and so on. However, the East was largely excluded from this. You know, they, they wanted to get a deal done and including the East would have made it even more sort of lengthy. So, so in a sense, the East was uh, excluded and so some of the chickens seemed to be coming home to roost. So the, uh, the, Beja, the Beja tribes, um, one of the dominant tribes, in the east to a um here recently on the 20th of september it first started blockading and this, this is something we've seen throughout africa libya and so on it's, it's it's a common thing you know you use what what tools you have at your disposal to, to to make your case um this was resolved relatively quickly i would say it took took about a week and some uh Judicious, judicious diplomacy with with a delegation from Khartoum heading out east, but I think I think this this still it's something that could still re revive. And the problem is you you have these um, blockages of, of pipeline flows. It 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 has impacts right down into the south as well. There's there's talk in the south. I mean, it has been for a while of of, of having a separate pipeline which would um, exclude Sudan altogether um, via Lamu port in uh, yeah, Kenya. It. Yeah, yeah that's it, exactly. Um, and uh, so that, that's getting a little bit of chatter, a bit more serious than, than before. It's still a hugely uh, expensive and, and, and tricky project. Um, we, we did hear that some of the contract, contractors involved, uh, uh, the Kenya end, are sort of quite uh, optimistic about it. I think we'll have to wait and see, um, but it's certainly always been a useful uh, tool for South Sudan to sort of, or, 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 a, or a tool, but a, a, I guess a, a sort of mechanism or a, a way of, of influencing the, the cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you for that, James. The Sudan certainly places that we keep an eye on and be looking at in, in much greater detail mm. coming along. Uh, staying in East Africa, our parrot to Dan Knox is um, is here with us today. And Dan, you, you were looking at two intriguing, um, possibly contrasting East African experiences: the uh, the emergence of uh, 
the main lines of how the presidency of Samia Suluhu uh, Hassan is going to look in Tanzania, and uh, also um, the latest developments in uh, Kenya and its independent power projects and IPPs, um, with the new presidential task force actually delivering its results on time. Uh, and you, you saw contrasts between these two, and you were more positive for once about uh, Tanzania than Kenya, if I read you correctly. Yes, I think it's kind of, it's been a tale of two energy sectors, I guess, <laughs> energy, energy leaderships in Tanzania and Kenya with um, big changes in both countries. Um, in Tanzania, you had a change of energy minister who was one of the um, appointees of the previous president, John Magafuli, um, generally regarded a little bit of a yes man, um, not a particularly strong minister, um, not hugely popular uh, in the industry either, um, replaced with a much more dynamic uh, younger guy who, well, at least by Tanzania's standards in his kind of late 40s, um, was one of the youngest presidential uh, contenders for the ruling party in 2015. Um, who's written a lot more about uh, reform of Tonesco, um, is regarded as being pro-business. Um, and at the same time, you've had changes at Tonesco, um, an entirely new board, quite a well-respected chairman brought in, for, again, from the private sector, well, partly from the private sector, also from the World Bank, um, which may be significant for um, refinancing efforts going forwards. Um, uh, he spent a few years at the World Bank, quite a lot more time at the World Bank's International Finance Corporation, which is the part of the World Bank that deals with the private sector. Um, and then a new MD as well, who's come in from um, cable TV, uh, where he headed um, one of the big companies uh, for a couple of regions for a few years. So you have a few um, quite experienced leaders coming into the sector. Um, there have also been changes at the Ministry of Energy with senior officials um, and things like that. And it seems that most of this is geared towards Tanzania LNG and the large LNG projects, uh, as well as the pipeline from Uganda. So this is very clearly um, Samir's priority. This is what she wants to do. Um, there's some optimism that there might actually be some kind of uh, paper signed before the end of the year, although it's unlikely that anything particularly meaningful will be signed until 2022. But um, it's, it's certainly looking more positive. Uh, on the other hand, the power sector in particular is, 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 it seems to be getting not a lot of public attention in all of this. And uh, there's still a huge amount of questions about where, what the strategic vision is going to be in Tanzania. We've got a huge dam being built um, people are not sure it's going to generate as much power as the government has said it will. They've, nobody is sure where, who's going to buy the power, as Tanzania already has more power uh, than it needs a lot of the time. Um, it'd be quite heavily seasonal, so a lot of questions about the direction um, the country is going in and what it's going to do about these uh, big kind of elephants in the room. Always, uh, always, those, always those big questions, and that's before the balance of forces in the ruling CCM and the politics and ideology that colour yeah. and the life are there. Now, Kenya, we always think of as probably a bit more business oriented market, but the independent power producers there um, are feeling, I suspect, slightly queasy at the thought that they may have um, demands to uh, to be paid less and spend more would that be a fair uh, a fair um assumption around the presidential task force and the developments going on there in the power sector well it's been an interesting reaction to the presidential task force so um uh president kenyatta set up a task force earlier in the year to look at the power sector which rec made recommendations within six months which of itself came as a relief to the industry. There's been a moratorium on negotiating PPAs during that period, and, and lots of people were afraid that that would just drag on. Um, 
the task force has recommended that all existing PPAs are re reviewed or are renegotiated, although within contractual frameworks, which I think has given um, IPPs some, uh, some limited optimism. Um, there are lots of recommendations about Kenya power as well. Um, but it, it's had quite a mixed reaction from, from the industry. Um, quite a lot of IPPs expected it, especially those with more expensive power. Um, some have actually welcomed it and say, you know, Kenya does need to bring down its cost of power. Um, it does need some degree of reform of its PPAs and capacity payments, given um, current kind of inability to sell. Um, a lot more IPPs have, have pointed out that actually, you know, what the government needs to do is stimulate demand, um, which has a far greater impact on Kenya Power in particular's finances, um, because paying for deemed energy and capacity is much more damaging than tariffs, which is obviously a lot of the IPPs are keen to point out. Um, the lenders, I think, are much more reluctant to, to renegotiate, so uh, there's not going to be a lot of scope. I think for changing tariffs, IPPs I think are going to show willing because, especially as in an arbitration, you you benefit a lot from having shown willing um, in your negotiations with the utility. Um, lenders, on the other hand, are very keen not to set a precedent. They believe that um, changes in the sector. Um, obviously, this this presidential task force report was also accompanied by sacking the the energy minister and the Absolutely. and the changing the cabinet. The uh, principal secretary at the Ministry of Energy. So um, it, there's a lot of um, reluctance with from lenders to give in to basically what they see as a very political moment with elections coming in 2022. They don't want it, a precedent to be set across Africa whereby when a government needs lower tariffs to win an election, they can just turn around, call for renegotiations and the lenders cave um i think they will be very reluctant to to do anything and if they do they will require um reform at kenya power that's very public and they will also require in most cases to be seen publicly and in statements as partners in reform efforts rather than opponents trying to fleece the country fascinating fascinating stuff so kenya as we know is a very important market We're hugely worth following in detail as we try to um, on its own, but also uh, the developments there with ramifications for the wider, the wider region. If we can move on, the third um, member of our, our team who's come on the podcast today is Mark Howard. Um, and Mark, um, who uh, we know well for looking at strategies, also been looking at looks at some of the uh, the more ma micro details of um, the energy industries and particularly Mark you've been looking at the burgeoning commercial and industrial markets um, particularly in West Africa and in eastern southern and your largest piece I think was actually about uh, Zimbabwe's first big embedded commercial and industrial solar projects um, for, for a tea, menu, uh, tea, tea planter um you really looking at cni markets booming now yes john you're absolutely right um it's quite an interesting phenomenon because it seems to be occurring in countries where you perhaps expect it more you know whether it isn't necessarily reliable or um cost competitive grid power um you know available on a routine basis but also we're seeing even in, in markets, you know, with a, with a good grid, a stable grid and one that has the best of tariffs, we're also seeing um, CMI solutions being offered. So, I mean, Zimbabwe is clearly a case of the former. Problems with its grid are very well documented. Um, businesses, industries in Zimbabwe have long struggled with um, power outages. You know, sometimes these can last 10 to 12 hours a day. So clearly industries um, that rely uh, upon consistent power supply are really in trouble if they can't continue their operations. It can cause huge problems to their bottom lines. So as you mentioned, um, I covered a, um, a development at the Tanganda Tea Estate um, in eastern Zimbabwe. And um, this is a company that produces tea and coffee, as you say. Um, and you know, agro-industrial businesses such as this, having reliable power is so important, you know, whether you want to irrigate your crops 
whether you want to keep your produce um, you know, cool so it's um, uh, you know, ready for uh, packaging and transportation or export abroad. Reliable power is so important to um, industrial companies, particularly in the agricultural sphere. So what we're seeing um, with this project, it's extremely significant because it's the first large scale embedded plant, as you said. So um, an interesting aspect of the commercial viability or a business case, if you like, for this plant has been the ability to um, sell power back to the grid. You know, um, Tangans are going to sell um, surplus solar energy that they generate back to Zessa. Um, it also incorporates um, this plant um, a um, battery energy storage system um, from Samsung and um, some diesel generation backup as well. And um, yeah, the, the, the plant itself, I should, I should say, is actually, I'm referring to it in, in the singular, but of course it's actually, as you'll see in the article, over um, three separate sites that have recently come online in the company's largest tier estates. So you've got Rattleshook, Tingamira and Jersey. And um, yeah, and Tangando are very happy um, with the, uh, the installation that's been carried out for them by their EPC contractors. And they're hoping to have these plants grid tied in the near future. So it's quite a significant development in the Zimbabwean market. And I think one that will be mimicked, um, especially when we bear in mind the importance of mining um, and um, agriculture to that country's economy. You know, there are clear um, opportunities here for large players in these sectors to, um, you know, to save huge amounts of money by um, moving to these forms of uh, power generation. Very good to have a, a positive business and a news story coming out of um, Zimbabwe. In, um, in, in West Africa, um, there was a small story um, catching up on the Hyundai gold mine in Burkina Faso. Of course, the mining being the, uh, the, 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 the core of uh, CNI traditionally in, in many African countries. But also you went and you talked to um, Solar X um, company, and they were particularly bullish about uh, Senegal amongst their West African um, package. Um, what, what did you particularly take out of your conversations with them? Yeah, it was a really interesting um, conversation with the chief executive of um, SolarX and um, Kareem Gamachi. And his firm is, is a relatively new one. Um, they've commissioned three plants this year, but they've got 50 megawatts in development. And um, a key takeaway for me was, um, you know, CNI solar projects are still a relative novelty in many West African markets. Um, so you're, you're sort of, um, Karim was saying that in some ways you're, you're demonstrating the capability of this technology to perhaps somewhat skeptical business owners and executives. But um, once they see the savings, um, the decision becomes quite an easy one for them. And another, another very interesting insight from Karim was that um, in countries um, such as Senegal, as you mentioned, actually, um, Senegal in the near future is anticipated, as we know, to have um, uh, or will have, you know, a large dispatchable uh, power capability from all the gas that it's um, going to be exploiting from its offshore reserves. And this, um, Kareem said, isn't actually a source of competition necessarily to firms like his that are looking to install renewable systems. It can actually be very complementary because if you've got this dispatchable baseload of power being supplied by gas generation, for instance, then you can add a lot more renewables to the grid you know, without um, imperiling grid stability. So actually it's a big win-win scenario to have a transitionary fuel like gas um, that, that works in tandem with renewables. And, you know, they'll, they'll both complement each other on the grid, but it'll also encourage, um, it'll enable, sorry, more capacity to be added by, via embedded CNI plants to the grid. So for these commercial companies that are looking at the uh, return on investment on their plants, they should in theory then be able to sell a lot more power back to the grid, you know, in the coming 15, 20, 25 years potentially. So it's quite interesting insight there. That there's this potential win-win between, you know, the, the new generation of, um, of renewable fuels, if you like, but also gas as a, as a transitionary fuel. Thank you. It's interesting. SolarX, I, I, I was interested to see, is backed by the uh, Paris-based Energy Access Ventures Fund, which is itself backed by a development finance institution, DFIs, including the Dutch FMO, uh, the UK's CDC, as well as that very active company, Schneider Electric. And uh, I think we're still seeing in the CNI market a big uh, role for the DFIs, as in with the on-grid, uh, but also um, seeing this market grow. We're seeing, I know on our consultancy side as well, um, very substantial. Uh, amount of interest from 
those constituencies. So that was just a taste of what we had in African Energy issue 447. Um, we went around a huge number of different projects um, with analysis of everything from what the ArcelorMittal's um, uh, Arsenal, Arsenal um, f agreement at last to expand its Liger uh, Liberian um, iron ore production and, uh, and uh, infrastructure hub, which of course has huge, um, huge consequences for um, Guinea. Um, to, um, as we said before, Egypt and, uh, and the Lebanon gas deal. Um, we looked at the uh, World Bank's doing business getting cancelled after what was seen as in, um, interference and the whole debate um, that has, um, has crystallised around um, now uh, IMF Managing Director uh, Kristalina Georgieva, uh, who was formerly um, the chief executive of the World Bank Group. Lots and lots of different things, some positive, some negative. Um, we'll be back for issue 448 um, with uh, a lot of interesting features, one of which is we're exploring from several angles um, what the Chinese are doing, not just to say there's a lot of money there, aren't the Chinese big, and there's some perfidy, well, I'm sure that will um, raise its, uh, those issues will be uh, tackled, but actually looking ahead to see after what President Xi said about coal, uh, the way that China's own policies are evolving, which way they're going. So that's just one of many issues we'll be discussing in the next African Energy. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Very great thanks to, to Dan, to James, to Mark, uh, to Harry Randall Marsh for setting it up as always. And we will talk to you and hopefully give you some good reading very soon.